I'm Freddie Carver, and I'm the head of the Regional Durable Solutions Secretariat. Um, we are a small team uh, that works on behalf of 14 NGOs uh, in the region, focused on responses to forced displacement uh, and trying to really help aid actors deal with the challenges of protracted displacement particularly um, and support NGOs, UN agencies, donors, local authorities, um, and communities find uh, more durable and meaningful solutions to displacement. I think we all know the challenges of that. Um, and I think, uh, but I also have um, a, pr a former life, um, num a number of former lives, but one of which was as a researcher working with RVI. So I had some involvement um, with the Accept program in the early days, particularly doing work on the Ethiopia-South Sudan border and looking at the dynamics around uh, aid in borderland spaces. And I think that goes to the heart of what we want to talk about now and really to the heart of the challenge for policymakers, um, whether they are representatives of regional states or donor countries uh, or UN agencies uh, or NGOs. Um, it really is a governance challenge. We, we struggle with dealing with multiple messy layers of governance in the best of times. And borderland spaces, borderland environments create multiple overlapping um, sets of governance processes, dynamics, um, which we really struggle to even begin to recognize, let alone have a clue uh, how we can possibly engage, support in useful ways, um, uh, even to be able to do no harm can be difficult in these environments because we just don't understand the spaces through which we're navigating. And I think some of the work that, uh, and this becomes very clear when we look at it from the perspective of aid actors, um, the center of gravity for almost every aid agency that's part of the international aid system are national capitals. We're, it's, it's completely ingrained in the DNA of the system. And we see borderlands as peripheries, as spaces kind of outside, beyond, difficult to engage with. But the key thing is that borderlands have their own center of gravity, as was, as was discussed beforehand, and particularly I think some of the points that Toby was making towards the end. They have their own centers of gravity, and unless we can really shift our mindset uh, and understand what those centers of gravity look like and how uh, governance processes interact across these lines, then we really don't have a, have a hope. Um, and again, from the issue, the, the issue of forced displacement is a great example where the international community has these very binary definitions of who a refugee is based on whether they've crossed a boundary um, in an environment like Gambela, in an environment like Dadaab, in an environment like northern Uganda. We, people spend a long time trying to define who is, who is what in a way that just doesn't even, uh, isn't even close to being meaningful to people from these places. So all of these are governance challenges and I think we've got a great uh, set of people to help us explore and understand what some of those governance challenges mean and how we are trying to engage with them and, and, and should do in the future. So we're gonna start uh, for, with, with a series of kind of practical examples and case studies. Um, we're gonna start with uh, Michael Ojambo um, and then we'll also hear a bit from uh, Ethiopia We'll also hear from South Sudan and its borderland spaces. And, and at the end, we're going to hear a bit about the policy response as well. But as I say, I, I really encourage you to chip in as we go along. Um, to introduce Michael, he's, he's a lawyer by uh, training um, from Kenya, but he also uh, founded and ran an NGO focused on um, policy research and advocacy, uh, Reconcile, um, for uh, more than a decade. Uh, and since then, he's been focused on research, um, and particularly uh, research around governance of land and natural resources. Uh, and he's part of the Accept Research team for Takana Karamoja border as a policy analyst. And it's that experience which, which he's going to talk to um, now. So thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, Freddie. Uh, good afternoon. I, I, what I want to do is to make three points by way of what on the basis of the research we are doing on the border between Kenya and Uganda, what we see as the problem or challenge uh, of governance, which has implications for stability in, in the borderland. And then I'll make three points on what I see as the elements of appropriate responses at policy and programming level. I think the first uh, issue is uh, one gets a sense uh, from, you know, formal readings, whether it's in policy documents or in research reports, that there is a pervasive skepticism about communities and their institutions and their competence to, 
to, to deliver uh, on issues, including issues of governance. What our research has shown is that indeed communities also are skeptical about formal systems and their capacity to deliver uh, on key issues, including governance. Uh, when we first started our research, uh, because our research has a policy component and we're talking about the need to engage policymakers, at our first meeting, uh, a number of community people who are part of our research team didn't understand why we think government should be part of the conversation because for them, government is the problem, uh, therefore not the solution. So it's important, I think, for us in the spaces we work in to understand that this skepticism is reciprocal and there is a need for us to, you know, to bridge that gap. For us, one, the formal systems to understand the, the potential role, the, the experiences uh, of communities and community systems, and for a deeper understand, a deeper effort to make communities understand that governments and government frameworks have to be part of the solution, part of the conversation, not least because if they are not involved, they have this amazing capacity to corrupt whatever communities try to do. So that's my first point, this skepticism we have to find a way of getting around it. The second problem is the place of communities in what I call the actor-stakeholder continuum. You know, we talk about actors and stakeholders, sometimes use the words interchangeably, but there, if you think about the verb to act is, uh, is a transitive verb, is, is to do something. And in these spaces and in these problems, there are those who do things and there are those who suffer the consequences of what is done. So communities are often stakeholders in the sense that they experience the results of the actions that are done, sometimes without having the capacity themselves to do anything in order to create those situations. So understanding where the communities fall within this stakeholder actor continuum is important in then being able to understand what roles they can play and how we get them to be part of the, you know, of the solutions that we, we design or that we propose. The last point I make about challenges is what Freddie has alluded to, which is the, the key issue here is a governance problematic. I mean, the governance is a big issue in, in the borderlands. And the reason why it is a big issue is that often, in the morning I insisted on the idea of thinking about communities, not just as part of institutional arrangements at national, regional, and global level, and with reason. Because communities, in the sense in which we are talking about them here, and having due regard to, uh, to, to Ikal's uh, misgivings about the term, communities are not, communities themselves are a, a, a contested realm. In other words, communities are not homogeneous. So when we talk about representation, it is possible to have a person with a community tag in a representative institution who doesn't actually represent the community. Because it's a question of the dynamics through which people get to be taken as representative of communities. And this is a big failure of the democratic system uh, for, for many of these communities in the sense that, you know, my country is popular for since independence, we have held regular elections every five years. And therefore, we wish all these communities, and, and this is something we raised when we started our research in Turkana, there's no space in this country which does not have a representative, an elected representative, who is a key part of the governance system. So when communities react so adversely to the idea of, of, you know, of government being part of the solution, it is a statement of the inadequacy of the systems by which we get communities voices to be represented in fora, in spaces of decision making. So we must go behind this governance framework when we can begin to ask, how do we ensure that true community voices, and, and you know, it's, it's very complex because people say inclusiveness is a very good term, but communities don't want to be included. They want to be at the center of the process because they are the ones who are experiencing these problems. When you say included, there's already a hierarchy. You are starting a process and you bring them in. I think communities are asking for more than that. In, 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 in our experience in, in, in Turkana, 
the communities are saying they are the ones who experience the problem, but all the people working on the solutions come with their solutions and want to sell those solutions to them. In other words, they are objects of intervention rather than subject of the interaction that leads to the design of intervention. So that's a governance problem that we have to address in order to get to the core of the problem. In terms of responses, I think first, it's not, a, it's not a, an either or situation. It's not a choice between having communities in this conversation or having these other structures in the conversation. It's about looking for mechanisms of ensuring that communities are part of these processes, that communities themselves are recognized as key actors, complementary to, but also separate from the institutions that purport to be working on these community issues. And that is why, that's why my, my fourth tire response to Martha was that there has to be a, a, a community as a separate and distinct constituency and actor in addition to and complementary with these other layers where community voices are represented. A friend of mine sitting next to me in the morning said, we say no man or woman is left behind, but often we leave the camels behind because the communities are not part of the conversation. As far as the community is concerned, if the camels have been left behind, that is not inclusive. So the conversation has to go to that level. How do we ensure that communities are part of this conversation in a more effective way than in just in terms of inclusion? To do that, our research shows we need to invest more in understanding the opportunities in intra and inter-communal processes systems, institutions, and experiences. And that is why we feel that we must talk about communities, not as core elements of other institutional arrangements, but as an institutional arrangement in and of itself that then interacts with and complements the other layers of institutional arrangements. And finally, we must then strengthen communities and their institutions as a distinct and complementary framework in thinking about the peace and security architecture for the borderlands. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Michael. I think a really fantastic um, opening intervention to really kind of to, to focus us on these questions of, of relationships. Uh, I think a strong theme that I, I took out of that was this issue of trust uh, and, and trust and legitimacy um, and the lack of trust that undermines um, these, these kind of ability to have this discussion between different governance arrangements and think about how different governance arrangements can fit together. And I think also very, very uh, strongly resonant with my work at the moment is this question of inclusiveness and centering um, and subjects and objects. And, 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 and I go back to the point that I made before around centers of gravity, and I find it quite a useful way of thinking about this question. Uh, if fundamentally, the, the exam question is, how do we make governance in borderland spaces work for Nairobi or Addis Ababa or Juba or Khartoum, uh, the very question, oh, hopefully that's still working, to how does it work in its own terms and then, but also going to your point, both seeing as a separate entity, but also as part of this bigger network. And I think it's holding these multiple levels in our heads at, at the same time that's really challenging. So I want to turn now um, to our, our second panelist, uh, Mascana Mulageta. Um, to talk a little bit about um, some research uh, and some work in Ethiopia that RVI has been doing. Ms. Karnow is um, a senior governance expert who's been working uh, on issues relating to human rights, conflict management, democratic governance, and civil society for uh, many years. Um, he's worked with the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, uh, the UK Department for International Development, and Irish Aid. And he's currently working uh, with uh, RVI on the Peace Research Facility in Ethiopia. So over to you. Thanks, Ms. Kana. Um, thanks, Freddy. I, uh, I'll be speaking on uh, the risks and opportunities of cross-border political dynamics to political settlements like Ethiopia. So it, it will be a bit Ethiopia-focused, but looking at some of the trends that this borderland politics is sort of reflecting on center politics, but also center politics reflecting on this uh, borderland political dynamics. I'll be relying on uh, a lot of our work uh, with a peace research facility of RVI that we've been doing for the past year, a uh, lot of conflict trends, political trends, broadly in Ethiopia, but including uh, some, of this, uh, some of these borderlands. 
I think it's important to sort of say it's a sin. A lot of it has been talked about, I think, in the morning session, uh, especially about Ethiopia, where political transition has been stalled or even backslidden. A new political settlement is still being forged, uh, very bumpy alignment and realignment of forces, political forces from within, but a huge conflict crisis erupting in the past four years. And I think that also meant a weakening of monopoly of violence, especially monopoly of violence of the, of the center, uh, underpinned by, like I said, a very huge conflict dynamics, but also a very strong political crisis that also impacted uh, center-periphery relations or borderland center relations. And I think the last point to say the scene would be Ethiopian borderlands are a bit diverse and complicated. Uh, we, can't, we can't say borderlands to apply to a certain area in Ethiopia and assume that it applies to other countries. Uh, the examples that we've used, for instance, today, Al-Fashga, which is our, the border with Sudan in the north, uh, if you look at the dynamics and its role in, in, in internal politics in Ethiopia and compare it to, say, a Gambela borderland or a Ben Shangul borderland, the actors, the dynamics and the access will be different. So when we say borderlands in, in such a very complicated context, it is to, it is to a certain extent with a caveat that they might be in and by themselves self-contained uh, self -contained issues. So I think that that caveat must al always be stated. Uh, I'll make sort of three broad observations on, on the risks and opportunities on the conflict dynamics and maybe in the last one on the political settlement. On the conflict dynamics, uh, one of the most prominent issues in Ethiopia is re-emergence of insurgencies. Uh, there are a lot of insurgent movements that are emerging now. A uh, lot of armed groups. Uh, three, four years ago, Ethiopia was known as a very strong center, securitized approach, uh, conflict managed broadly. Uh, in the center, having broadly a, a very strong monopoly of violence. With the political transition, a lot of armed groups re-emerged, and borderlands have provided that space. In a lot of these borderlands, armed groups operate. Uh, let's speak to examples. Uh, Oromia Liberation Front operates in the western border, which borders South Sudan. Uh, ben Shangul, a uh, couple of armed insurgent groups operate in the borderland areas between Sudan and, and Ben Shangul Gumuz. Uh, so th there's a lot of space that's being provided for reemergence of insurgents. That's, that's one of the patterns we're seeing. But neighbors, neighboring countries and uh, you know, we've been saying in the morning also the governance in, in the Horn has been very complicated and a lot of these countries are also having problems. And that has meant that exploiting this uh, has become a bit limited, at least to, to the extent that between these countries we haven't seen a full-fledged uh, war maybe at, for direct fear of confrontation between these two countries <coughs> or maybe because they have their own problems at home that's much greater than uh, than, you know, the, having skirmishes over, over these issues. But there, ha there has been opportunities that has been exploited. And a case at point is Al-Fashka, right? The start of the Ethiopian Tigray War, Sudan's army have regained control of that border area. And that border area uh, is not really, I don't know any analyst to, to describe it as a peripheral border area. It's very center. The political actors operating that are very center. The economic movement is very essential to uh, center politics and therefore very determinant to finding any sort of political settlements in Ethiopia. I think that's the first point. The second point would be around subnational processes finding space and maybe agency in the past four years uh, in Ethiopia, which is sort of, that's a two-way street. It might be and I'll come back to that point about more assertive subnational actors in Ethiopia emerging, and these subnational actors have presence and control over borderlands. So regional, in, in, in the Ethiopian federal context, we call them regional states, but these subnational actors being assertive, but also that assertiveness in terms of opportunity have created a space to forge some type of peace. Couple of examples, again, Ben Shangul, uh, the, the regional state has negotiated both uh, in October with, uh, with uh, Gumu's People Democratic Movement, and in December with, with BPLM also, uh, you know, some peace deals of negotiated by regional governments with armed groups to, to sort of bring them 
to, to the table. So second point is around opportunities, around finding a peace, peace actors, peace deals by subnational actors in these borderlands. I think the last sort of point is around opportunities and risks for the political settlement itself. A lot of people would analyze, and I think that was a common sort of framework of analysis, a center-periphery relationship in Ethiopia. And a lot of these areas, like I said, a lot of the borderlands does not necessarily mean they are peripheries. Some of the borderlands in Ethiopia are really at the center of its politics. But that relation is changing or uh, is evolving in a way. So some of it is politically. So for example, we, are a very, we were a very strong party state. That party has changed. Now we have a lot of regional states as members of the ruling party, prosperity party. So that means representation role has increased for a lot of these, par these formerly affiliate parties that used to rule over peripheral areas to, to actually be at the center of the politics. But it's expressed at least in two ways. I think, firstly, on the government's attempt, and now we're seeing a clear attempt to reclaim monopoly of violence, these are so, for example, decisions to dismantle special forces, special regional forces. And these are having impacts on, on borderlands. One of the most recurring analysis that was being given when the decision was announced around Somali region was a lot of these special forces might actually join forces in Jubaland. So decisions to reclaim monopoly of violence might, might affect border, borderland security and other neighboring countries. And then again, uh, you know, in places like Al Fashga, uh, at the start of the Sudan conflict, there was news that some of the local uh, militiamen tried to, re to, to retake that place. So there will be a possibility by which regional forces would operate by their own, uh, which is inspired by the space created by the weakness of the center, but also opportunities that arise uh, in, in what's happening in these border areas. On the attempt to find a new political settlement, it's a two-way street. The center have used these borderlands to, for example, claim legitimacy. Uh, when this government came, uh, the Al-Fashga point, which uh, I think in the morning it was fairly described as a practical deal between Sudan and the government, was changed because there was a lot of demands to claim that. And that actually resulted in some type of legitimacy, some, to, some type of popularity to the central government. So central government also uses this borderland politics to gain legitimacy, to get support from these borderland political actors. But it's also the other way around. They, it has created a space for these subnational actors to also exploit these borderlands to their own benefits. A case at point will be the recent reports coming out uh, where Amhara uh, forces are being supported by Eritrea, which is uh, you know, regions or subnational forces trying to create alliances with neighboring countries operating in borderland areas. So it's a very changing dynamic, but I think the most common pattern uh, is that binary description of center periphery uh, is evolving at least in a political settlement like Ethiopia with a new actor, which are uh, subnational regional actors. I think I'll stop there. Wonderful, thank you so much, Muskana. And I think you've really helped uh, helped us move out. I think we, we, we started talking about the community level, um, and now you've really brought a whole a additional set of dimensions around subnational actors, national politics, and this complex layering and interplay. I almost think there's a kind of, there's a, there's a sort of counter, or a, a, a point that echoes what Toby said earlier about borderland spaces being spaces which kind of circulate politics, they circulate go governance. Uh, where these things can be kind of created and recreated all the time. And I think that also that notion of thing, how things change all the time is really important. So I want to turn now to Dr. Jan uh, Pospisil. Um, and he, he's going to talk to us a bit about looking at this from the perspective of South Sudan. I think continue our, our sort of expansion outwards to think about a kind of national conflict system and where the borders fit into that. Um, Jan is, a, is an associate professor at Coventry University Center for Trust, Peace and Social Relations. Um, he headed the work stream on local post peace agreements and the political settlements research program at the University of Edinburgh and is a co-investigator in the Peace Rep program. Uh, and over the last few years, he's been part of a team conducting South Sudan Public Perceptions of Peace Survey, uh, a project that he's going to talk a, bit, a little bit about now. So over to you, Jan. Thanks. Thanks so much, Freddie. Um, indeed, it will be more empirical now. 
Um, and it will be very Sapsalan focused, but I want to make four points that I think are relevant beyond the immediate context, which is first, I want to talk about South Sudan as borderlands, so not South Sudanese borderlands, which is a quite important distinction. Um, second, then, the question you raised about trust and like the importance of everyday security, basically, for trust in transitions. Then the question of legitimacy, and finally, the question of how to govern um, such a difficult and diverse space of borders um, um, with data we have. Um, and indeed, um, I want to use empirical data from the South Sudan Peace Perception Survey. We ran this survey now for the fourth time. It's a team led by David Deng from that group consultancy, then um, Christopher Ringer from Juba University and Sophia Dawkins from Yale and myself. We are the senior team and it's about 70 more researchers in the whole country involved in, in the exercise. We have, you, you see the four waves, we started basically 2021 and just now completed the fourth wave. We had about 9,000 responses in the first three waves and we've expanded now to 15 counties in the country. Um, this is the 13 count, the 12 counties we were before, we have added um, three, Tarit, Gogrial and up their rank, which has been mentioned quite a few times before already because it's basically the, the closest bit to, to, to Khartoum in a way. Um, and we had about 4,600 responses of um, wave. Just to say methodically, the only thing I want to raise, we are not representative for the whole country with the data I'm going to show, but we are representative for these 15 counties or like in the previous waves for these 12. Um, so the numbers for these counties, and since we've done it a few times, are, are surprisingly solid. So um, I have quite some trust in, in the data we are producing here. Just to go to the, yeah, here's, here, here's moving. Um, why talk about South Sudan as borderland as such? Um, it, the fact that like, um, uh, there is a, several kind of, of, of elements that basically characterize borders in South Sudan. It's just not the, the national borders that we are so much concerned here with, but essentially the country has so many borderlands in between, and it's in between, and this is here, when you look at different counties and how the safety perceptions look like, places that are very safe, very kind of regular kind of living with places that are very dangerous, this shifts also quite a lot, and these places are very close to one another. You have even in, 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 in some areas still camps where the reality between the camps and the outside, which is just a few miles often, is completely different. And then you have also the dimension that people get, like, and it's just not borders, it's just not a state thing, people can get very excited about county boundaries, for instance. So, and this is an interesting thing, when you run the survey, and you run the survey in Ural East, and like, you have one dot which is on a map in Ural West, and then you talk with the people on the ground, oh, they know exactly where these boundaries lie, and these boundaries get people excited. So we have various levels of how these boundaries and borders actually are within the country. It's just here, the only, the only reason, I won't go into, into details here, is just to see the more red, the more insecure people feel. And you see between places like a wheel, um, now our center, also like now, recent, more recently lakes, people feel very safe. In other areas, like people are the most um, 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 impressive example, but you have also Ye, for instance, um, more recently Yambu, where people feel just very, very unsafe. So you have like completely different realities, um, how people experience. Um, and um, you see the same like basically patterns, and this is the next point I'm going to make. Um, the difference is speaking to also how much trust you lie into, uh, into a transition process. Um, Interestingly, also this uh, refers to mobilization patterns. So we asked the question of like, um, would, you, would you basically join an armed movement if, if elders or like traditional authorities would say so? And you see that there is huge, huge differences. The more red, the more people disagree. And you have in places like Ye and Yambio, like huge disagreement is not working at all. You have other places um, in, in, in other parts, like a wheel bore, where there's a surprisingly high agreement to this statement. So these the, the, the situations are completely different and like shape everything from mobilization patterns, patterns of armed violence, and also then probably mediation and conflict resolution patterns. Um, just I go to, to this thing I mentioned before, and this is the second point about the trust. When you now see um, how different these realities are, 
and how optimistic are people about the future prospects of the South Sudanese transition? And I can say it's I've just hear about like the this is this is ma mainly what people think um, about peace in the next three years, but it's essentially the same when it comes to trust in government, trust in the transitional process. So you get the same results. You see, actually, when you when you go through all the all the um, independent variables we had, the only real variable that counts is how safe people feel in their daily lives. This is the only real variable that explains how much trust people put into a transition process. And this was a very, very strong finding. It is consistent through all waves. This is consistent through all places. So with all these borderland kind of things and all these kinds of, this is an overarching factor that I think is like a high policy relevance. And like we've seen before, we've discussed this in, in terms of Sudan and we come to other uh, examples soon, that like public trust into a transition process is really, really valuable. So this is something that when it comes to implementation of peace agreements, um, all these kinds of deadlines and all these kinds of exercises and all these kinds of things, essentially what matters is everyday security. Um, I'm going through through things here and just want to go now to the importance of legitimacy because the interesting thing is now this everyday security gives us trust into a transitional process. It is not giving legitimacy necessarily to a government. Um, and here the interesting thing, I'm going to read these two, they're, they're not so relevant, um, and come to this slide. Um, the interesting bit is when you ask and we ask now, there, there is an election um, um, date set, which is December 24. And in the last wave, we had this date, and we asked people how they would approach elections. And here, the interesting finding is people desperately want to vote. Um, and this is something to be taken seriously. Often, the, the problem here is that, especially in complex transitions, and we, we discussed this in, self, in, 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 in relation to Sudan as well, often these perceptions are pushed a bit to the side and say, yeah, this is all good. Um, but, but perhaps we have to have so many other conditions in place before we can do that. Um, what matters is people want to vote. People want to vote soon. You see here basically 60% uh, basically it, to the, to the, at the date that is foreseen in the current mo roadmap, with about like 18% uh, willing to postpone by a year. Um, interestingly, um, and this is, the, this is the strongest finding, it does not matter at all if people feel that these elections would lead to higher violence or not. So here we correlate basically um, the perceived risk of election violence from very high on the, on, 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 on the far left to very low. And the only interesting bit this year to see, it makes no whatever difference if people want to vote or not. They're absolutely happy to vote, even if it would lead to to, they would perceive a very high risk of violence. So this is how important legitimacy, political legitimacy seems to be in transitional processes. And what also happens quite a lot, especially when you talk to internationals, they underestimate the level of like democratic education and politicization in, in places like South Sudan. Most of Sudanese, the funny thing is this country has never seen since its existence national elections last year in 2010. But most South Sudanese have elected and voted quite a lot in neighboring countries, in other kind of various other forms of election, traditional authorities, commissions, representatives. There is a high knowledge about how this, how this is. And people feel, like we, are, we, had, we asked this question as well, people feel prepared to do so. So it's kind of really important to not uh, see like, uh, they're not, it's not ripe and whatever these kinds of conditions there. Um, finally, just to the question of of governance now, and this is the the, the, the issue of like how this election will pan out. We've just asked this proxy question. We never asked people like well, how whom they want to vote for. It was seen as a bit too spicy in the current context. So we asked people of what do you think, what is the party with the best vision? And this tells us quite interesting insights when we come also to the diversity of places and, and like the internal kind of the management of this borderland configuration. Overall, this is, this is the national kind of outcome. Um, and this, these numbers are, in a way, solid to an extent that almost with 1% or 2% difference, it, they were the same in the third and the fourth wave. And in the fourth wave, we even added several counties. So this is the popularity. The interesting bit, what you see here, and this is the only interesting thing to take away, that the 
governing SPLM was rather successful to prevent any kind of viable opposition to emerge in all these areas on a national level. But they have been never able, and this is what I'm going to show in one, two more slides now, they have never been able to breach all these boundaries to become really like the national force they want to be. Um, because if you go to places, um, this is for instance, yay, where you see um, in the Equatorias that the popularity of IG is much lower already, and actually like there's a, a huge, huge element of, 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 of non-responses and non-party popularity, so it's already like a very different picture. Yambio, even like in, in, in Western Equatoria, even more like exciting with SPLM IG almost non-existent there and a high, high level of non-responses. Um, but the most interesting bit is also, and this is what I talked before, like the difference um, between outside and IDP camps, where you have basically a completely different political landscape when you look into the IDP and POC, like Malakal is the POC site, um, with, where the party kind of affiliations look completely different. And here, and this is with, with what I want to close basically, here there is questions of like how you want to run the representative government in these kinds of systems. And there is essentially two options that are, and this is, I guess, the problem not really yet discussed, which is on the one hand thinking of how could you perhaps translate the power sharing arrangement into also national representation? Is this one option? So how you represent parties who would never make a 4% threshold, would never have like a meaningful first past the post chance, how would you try to include them also in a post-election framework? Or you want to go a more radical solution into, I mean, South Sudan is, is bound to become a federal state whenever this kind of happens, but are you going to push more into completely regionalized different governance frameworks? And this would essentially mean totally different parts of South Sudan govern very, very differently. Both sides, both, both, both elements have, have their up and downs, but this is essentially the, the, the modes of governance that are, um, um, I think, um, at stake at the moment. That, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Jan. Um, I think really interesting and really interesting at this point in the conversation that we've been having. I think, well, a, n a number of things to take away, but two particularly that I, I take away. One is this notion of remembering that the sort of borders that we see on a map are, are, are not the only divisions uh, and the importance of applying the kind of principles that we've been discussing um, at different levels and within countries as well. I think Ethiopia is another example where this is extremely, extremely relevant. Um, but also I think this, this issue that has been discussed before and a couple of people have made that when we're talking about these messy governance processes, multiple things are going on at once and multiple things are true at the same time. So there's often a tendency when internationals talk about the elections to focus on elite competition, zero sum games, the problems in terms of conflict and violence. And all of that is true, but also true is this kind of and, and recognized and agreed on by many South Sudanese people, but also at the same time, there is this kind of thirst for legitimacy. And I think a, a really good initial response to the question that you posed around how do we, how do we address this trust issue? And I think accountability and representation is surely uh, a big part of the answer. So our, our last speaker is Stephen Karimi, um, who's a senior achieving fellow in conflict prevention and resolution at the University of York, and is currently pursuing a PhD in governance at Tangazi University in Kenya. Uh, he's worked in the peace and security field for over 20 years um, with experience in policy analysis and, and advocacy across the Horn. And he's currently the senior advisor for the Horn of Africa Regional Program at the Life and Peace Institute. And I think uh, he's going to expand this. We've gradually been kind of moving outwards and outwards, um, intentionally trying not to say upwards, um, because we have all these kind of hierarchies in our mind. But we're now going to engage a bit more at the regional level and think about how these, these layers of governance um, map into regional institutions and, and some of the work that's been done at that level. Thanks. Thank you so much, um, Freddie um, and colleagues. I think very good uh, interactions here and the sharing which has been happening since morning um, touches a lot on some of the things I'm going to say. So I will endeavor not to emphasize too much on certain points lest I bore you, but I think sometimes emphasis is good. <laughs> um, so I, as you're told, I work for the Life and Peace Institute, which is um, an international NGO working on in the Horn of Africa on matters peace and security. Um, the regional advisor, as you've been told. And so my, my intervention um, 
is going to touch so much on the work uh, that we've been doing in the Horn of Africa, working with IGAD and the African Union. And we're looking more at um, uh, policy level kind of interventions which have been uh, in place in terms of uh, enhancing cross-border uh, peace and security, or also what we call cross-border cooperation. So I'll um, uh, endeavor to just uh, flag out some few of them, not all the frameworks that um, are existing, the policy frameworks, policies and policy frameworks which are meant to promote good governance for cross-border cooperation. I will also just talk a little bit about what we have seen in terms of progress of how these are being applied or translated into changes or desired outcomes for cross-border cooperation or peace and security in the border areas. And maybe touch on a little bit of um, some challenges that we have observed why some of these are working or not working uh, properly the way they're supposed to be. And maybe just make some observations again on some of the actions that probably could, could be taken. So I'll talk about some engagement we had with IGAD. Um, um, sometimes back around 2015, we got, 2014, 2015, we started an engagement with IGAD on um, a research in the region because there had been talk in the region about informal cross-border trade being a vector for insecurity, cross-border insecurity or um, uh, security governance. And so we embarked on that study, uh, which we sampled several, several um, uh, border areas uh, in the Horn of Africa. And so we are calling it, uh, we are trying to establish whether there is any nexus any connection between informal cross-border trade. I think people have been talking about cross-border trade, but we are very particular about informal, because they're talking about the people who are far away from the former crossing points, and they are always crossing over to the other side of the border to conduct small businesses uh, and trade. And I think somebody mentioned here that um, uh, like 75%, actually I think we found a little more, 80, 85% of the people involved in this are actually women in the, in, in the Horn of Africa. And so, um, informal cross-border trade and cross-border security governance. The study, generally speaking, because I'm not going to get into details of that, I will touch on a few others that I'm going to mention here, is um, that actually there is very little or none, none at all connection between the two. Because there were arguments from various policy actors uh, circles that uh, these informal traders are also uh, uh, being used to cause insecurity in the, in the border areas. It's only maybe one or two cases where we understood some of the informal traders um, are used like to traffic small arms. Maybe you put a, a gun in your bag of grains and cross it over to the other side, but it's not common, it's not common. So these actually are people who are basically uh, eking out a living through this kind of trade. This is how they, they, they survive. This is how their families survive. And so what happened after that, um, we and got into another process, and we are doing this in collaboration with um, not just IGAD, it was IGAD and OSREA. I think some of you might know OSREA, the Organization for Social Science Research in Eastern Africa, and uh, local CSOs represented by one of our partners in Ethiopia called Inter-Africa Group. And so, it went uh, ahead, or rather we went ahead to produce a policy framework which is now owned by IGAD. It's like one of the processes, I would say, we saw results out of the research that we had done, translating that research into action. And I'm glad somebody seated in this room is actually was involved in the process of um, translating that research product into the policy framework, which is now uh, being used at the IGAD level. But I'll say something else more, a little bit about, about it, maybe that a, a bit later. But then we also worked with the, um, uh, the African Union Borders Program, uh, AUBP, as it were. And um, we, we, we tried to do some partnership with them, uh, making linkages between what is decided at the AU level 
and what happens in the borderlands. Well, the AUPP has a mandate to do several things, including looking into demarcation and delimitation of borders, capacity building, and so on and so forth. But then, besides that, they have also been at the center of um, campaigning for the um, uh, signing and ratification of the African Union, um, it is commonly known as the Niamey Convention or African Union uh, Convention on uh, Cross-Border Cooperation, which was passed how many years back? Since 2014 by the heads of state. But to date, it's only required to have 15 signatures and ratifications and the instruments of ratification deposited with the AU chair um, out of the 54 countries, 55? Okay, depending on who you ask. Eh? <laughs> okay, 55 countries. Uh, we are not able to get 15 signatures so many years later. I think as we speak today, we have only like uh, 17 or, or so signatures, those who have signed to that, that convention, uh, and only like um, six ratifications. There must be 15 signatures and ratifications. You sign, then you ratify, that's a procedure. Before this uh, convention can actually be put in place, or rather operationalized or applied, translated into results. So that was churned out, but still not operation so many years later. So within, again, the AU, um, a new framework is in place as we speak now. This is the, the African continent free trade area. Uh, what shocked us a little bit is the enthusiasm that the member states received this, um, this, this framework. And in one sitting, like 50 of them signed. Yeah, in one sitting, um, I think in Kigali or somewhere uh, during a summit even though it is also not yet fully signed. I think some two or three countries are remaining before it can be uh, fully ratified and um, uh, becomes operational. So there is that aspect as well. But then there are also some other level of, uh, of, of uh, uh, at, the, at the country level, we have uh, some structure called the Joint Border Commissions, which operate between the countries, like in Kenya and Ethiopia. These are, they represent the national government at that level, the border level, um, to work on issues, security, cross-border uh, collaboration, and so on and so forth. But those are spaces which are very close to participation, uh, say, of civil society or even borderlands communities that where they supposed to be working. So we have endeavored to engage these commissions and uh, it's only one meeting that we managed to have with them and they're beginning to realize that there is value engaging opening up the space for inclusion of ideas or bringing on board ideas from other actors like civil society and the borderlands communities so um as i as i, as I move forward i think some of the things the questions we're asking ourselves why is it that there are good cross-border policies which are being churned out at IGAD level and at the AU level, but they are not yet being used or they are not applicable yet. And I think one of the things we observed is some lack of priority on the part of the individual member states. So the heads of states or council of ministers, they will pass the, these frameworks up there, but then adopting it and domesticating it at home is a challenge, is a big challenge. I mean, and, and you talk to some of them, they'll be like, ah, well, we have a lot of uh, things in-house to deal with. It's not a priority for us to think about the regional things. We want to focus on what affects us domestically here. So that lack of priority to give, to give those issues priority is, is one of the things. And the other one, um, like in the case of uh, ICBT framework, which I told you we were very instrumental in uh, developing for IGAD, ICBT CBSG framework. Uh, though it has been passed and by the Council of Ministers, it still has a process to go, like uh, um, 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 now getting countries to embrace it fully and maybe come up with a national level uh, operationalization uh, structures of how to use that. And when you ask IGAD, they're like, well, we don't have money. We don't have finances to even popularize it in country. And so 
issue of financial resources and support to roll out some of these uh, frameworks. Um, okay, um, is, is, is an issue. And then there's also a bit of uh, um, lack of political goodwill, I think still. People will exercise it up there initially when they are pre passing these policies, but then after that, it disappears. But then I would say um, quickly what I think probably from our side needs to be done. We know there's a reforms process going on at the African Union. I think it's taken uh, quite a bit of time and I don't know when you're likely to get it fully uh, realized. And you see structures are changing. I mean, the people we have been working with at the AU might change. We don't know in terms of the, the placement of those structures. And that in itself, I think needs to, it, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our contention, needs to be really concluded so that then the borderlands communities that have been working with know exactly who to deal with at the AU so that we can um, um, operationalize some of the things that have been going on there. And the other thing is to support um, some ongoing and um, emerging efforts. We are working on something we are calling the Borderlands CSOs platform, which is going to serve as a as a space, a connection, a sounding board between the regional level policymakers and the community level uh, actors, the communities themselves. And this is a, an ongoing process between us, um, uh, AUBP, uh, IGAD, and the UNDP Africa Borderlands Center. Some of those small wins to us, I think they are really important not to be ignored. And it's possible to actually begin realizing some of um, uh, successes in, the, in this area. So to conclude, I'll, I'll mention maybe one more. There is need to, th to rethink the funding models that are being used to finance uh, rolling out of uh, policy frameworks. Innovation is required, and that has to be a consultative process with all participants. I don't know whether we call them uh, um, uh, stakeholders, like somebody was trying to put that difference. But we need as many people as possible because there must be ways that we are able to roll out these things without only looking into donor facilitation and so on. Donors are important, yes, but at least it doesn't mean if we don't have the resources, then we, we are just silent or we die a, a natural death. So I would like to stop here. And maybe we can interact during the question and answer time. But these are um, some of the things I wanted to share with the team. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. And I think that's a really important, I mean, I go back to the point I made earlier. It's, it's sometimes easy to be, uh, I think one hears a lot of cynicism sometimes about some of these regional initiatives. But I think we have to take these different levels of governance seriously. We have to think about how they connect to each other. And I think you've brought that out really, really clearly, Stephen. And there are some really interesting opportunities out of some of these processes at the moment. 